so good to be in the house of the Lord and feel his presence today, isn't it? Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Y'all are a good looking, good looking bunch today. I'm going to tell you. Amen. We are talking about the whole armor of God. We have sp spent a few weeks on this and I have been pretty good so far to be able to cover a piece of armor in a week, but I got to the shield of faith and, and this will be part two of the shield of faith. There may be a part three. I'm thinking there will be. Um, so you can just plan on that. But uh, the shield, um, the Roman shield was called the scutum. It was about this size. This is 48 by 24. They were anywhere from 24 to 33 inches up to 47 inches high. So maybe just a slight inch off of this one and you get the idea. They were curved like this. Um, so that arrows that would come in would glance off the sides. They, uh, with a flat shield, you have to work the shield like this and like this uh, to, to make the arrows bounce off. So they decided that they would curve them and they were quite rounded. Um, and, and you'll see in a picture in just a little bit um, that uh, Zach's going to put up on the screen for me, that they were quite rounded uh, to the point that the arrows coming in would glance off of them. And uh, with that in mind, let's read what the scripture has to say about our armor. We're going to pick up with Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to, uh, let's just read the whole passage again, because it's, we need to have this in our spirit. Um, Paul is writing the Ephesians and he uh, is talking to them and he starts with this word finally in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, my brethren. And this is what Paul is saying is, let me leave you with this. I've written a whole bunch of things to answer a whole bunch of concerns, but you've got to have this point. Don't miss this. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And this is important. We have to know this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the sage, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. I want to pause right there. Because we really haven't keyed in on this scripture as much. But I want the Lord, the Holy Spirit just given me something right now that I need to share with you. When we battle in the flesh, we target other flesh. We see what's coming against us as a product of flesh. In other words, that person at work who's giving me a hard time, well, it's just that person, and I'll show them. I'll give them a piece of my mind. You better be careful. You may not have enough to go around. Just saying. <laughs> Amen. Or you might want to keep that. You might need it later, you know. Um, but but what, what happens is when we fight flesh with flesh, we lose. When we fight in the natural realm, we lose. Even if we win, we still lose. In other words, even if by fleshly measurement, we're the winner, because we did it in the flesh, not in the spirit, we still didn't win. Because what, what have we done uh, other than show ourselves to be a person of flesh, a person who does not um, operate in the spirit. And even if we win, we still end up looking bad because we were uglier than the other guy. We were meaner than the other lady, right? And so what does that do to our testimony? We won, but we lost. So we have to realize that when... The enemy comes against us, he will use flesh and blood. He always uses flesh and blood. He will look around you to find the weak link around you and he will use that weak person that he can use to attack you. And then you know what will happen? You, instead of thinking that person is attacking you in the flesh, you, as a spiritual individual, will realize that there's a spirit behind the attack. There's always a spirit behind the attack. Amen. 
And it may be a spirit of division trying to separate you. It may be a spirit of intimidation trying to put you into fear. Uh, it may be a spirit to attack your faith. It may be uh, what, whatever is coming against you, there's a spiritual reason behind that. And we have to understand, Paul said, you've got to understand this. If you're going to battle in the spirit, you cannot fight in the fleshly realm. You have to understand that there is a spiritual reason behind the attack and you attack in the spirit, by the spirit, the other spirit of the enemy that's coming against you rather than attacking the other person. Amen. Amen. Peter, James, and John, and all the disciples at Jesus' command went and got in a boat. And they started rowing, and they encountered a storm. And Jesus was teaching them a principle. When they encountered that storm, Jesus had gone to the mountain to pray. And the Bible says in the, that, that they got in there in the evening. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came walking on the water. Now, evening starts at 6 p.m. The fourth watch of the night starts at 3 a.m. They've been there for a while. That's a few hours battling the storm. Peter, James, and John were what? What was their trade? Fishermen. You think they'd ever been in a storm before? You think they knew how to bail out a boat? Amen. Well, they were still alive, weren't they? <laughs> they obviously knew how to bail out a boat. They knew how to take on a physical storm in the physical realm. But what happened that night was that everything they were doing in the physical realm was not enough. And Jesus came walking on the water. And Peter said, Lord... If that's you, bid me to come. He said, come. And what he was doing was teaching them that there's a supernatural way of fighting against a natural enemy that supersedes the natural realm. And when Peter got out of that boat, he began walking on Je uh, to Jesus on top of the waves, on top of the storm, on top of the water. He was walking over the swells like they were little hills. Until he got to looking around and saw and started get, getting his mind back in the natural realm. When he got his mind back in the natural realm, what did he do? He began to sink. But before he went under, Jesus grabbed him by the hand, walked him back to the boat. And when they got to the boat, the Bible says the storm was gone. You see, the principle that Jesus was teaching the disciples is that sometimes your natural means of fighting a natural attack are not, not going to work. You sometimes, and really as a spiritual individual, you need to understand that you need to grab hold of the supernatural power of the Holy Ghost, the supernatural power of God to come against the natural storm in your life. Yes. Amen. It's not flesh and blood. It's flesh and blood getting used. But the real fight's in the spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, that was bonus. That was just a bonus. We'll get where we're going now. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. What do we wrestle against? Principalities, powers, rulers of this darkness age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places or spiritual realms. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, first week we talked about, having girded your waist with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness. And uh, Pastor Keith preached that one the second week. And then the third week, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We talked about that. Um, we talked about the fact that, I'm sorry ladies, it was the Roman soldiers that invented the strappy sandal. So, uh, yes, we talked about those. And uh, then last week, we began verse 16, and above all, taking the shield of faith with which, you, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All right. Now, we talked about the Roman shield. It's called the scutum. It's big, okay? Now, uh, what we found out about it was that 
In our study of the Roman scutum, the Roman scutum was not just a defensive weapon. I've learned, I've heard all of my life that the only offensive weapon we have was the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And that's true. That is an offensive weapon. But what we learned is that the, the, uh, the, the Roman soldier would, this had a handle on the back, much like this. And we're going to talk about this in a little bit. This is called a buckler. Okay, and uh, somebody says, why is it called a buckler? I said, hit somebody in the head and watch their knees. <laughs> it's a buckler. <laughs> Amen. Um, but it, uh, the Roman shield behind this uh, iron or steel plate on the back would have a handle like this. Okay, and the soldier would carry it in a fist grip in his left hand. Okay, his sword would be in his right hand. Now, I'm going to do it with this, but think of the size of that shield. Okay, when he would approach the enemy, he would take that metal part right in the middle. And he would throw it right into his chest or right into his head. Bam! With all of his force behind it. Okay? Big Roman soldier dude. Bam! That thing coming at you. Now, uh, it, th this one's about a, a fourth of the thickness that a real one would be. And so you've got that big guy, and he's got all that weight of that armor behind him, all of his force behind him, wham, right into, your, right into your chest or your head. What does that do? It's to throw you off balance. And when you're thrown backward, your arms flail out, at which point he retracts the shield, comes in with the sword. And that's how... The Roman legionnaires did it. That's how they were trained in battle. So the, fit, the, 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 the shield, the shield of faith, was not only a defensive weapon to get behind when the flaming arrows were coming at you, but it was also an advancement weapon. It was also uh, uh, an offensive weapon so that you could move forward taking ground. And that's why as, as the other waves uh, of the infantry would be coming to them, they would, one, two, this guy's down. Do it again if you have to, then step over him. And we talked about those shoes of faith. What do those shoes of faith have? Well, they had basically cleats, metal cleats all in the bottom of them. So when you would step over him, you wouldn't step over him, you'd step on him. And if you stepped on an arm, he's now got a broken arm. If he gets up, he can't fight. Okay, and then you've got another line behind you. So the guys that made it to the ground alive probably were not alive by the time line after line after line of Roman soldier marched over them. Wow, that's, that's real, isn't it? That's real. And Paul made use of this illustration because every person he was talking to was under Roman occupation. And they understood what a Roman's armor looked like. They understood what the shield looked like. They had probably gone by encampments of Roman soldiers and they had watched them practice over and over this defensive and offensive movement. They had seen them go into the testudo, which is the, the, um, uh, the defensive mechanism when the, the showers of... Um Showers of arrows were raining down on them. They would go into this defensive position in Latin called the testudo. And the testudo really just means turtle. And uh, if you have that picture and you can put it back up from last week. Oh, it's already up there. He's on it, man. I'm going to tell you. Um, and they would take their shields and they would get them edge to edge. They would get behind them. And then the guys in the second row, over top, the guys on the edges... On the sides. So all the arrows raining down couldn't get to them. The fiery darts of the wicked could not get to them. And then last week we talked about point number one is, is that our faith throws the enemy off balance. The enemy always comes against us with his attack. And one thing his attack is meant to do is remove us from our faith. Okay, the fiery darts that, that he wants to, 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 to send a dart, a flaming arrow, so that once it just hits, it doesn't just hit and hurt. It hits and then continues to smolder and burn. He hits you right here. 
We'll get to the helmet of salvation, okay? He hits you in your thoughts. He hits you with his lies. And he tells you you're not good enough and God doesn't love you and you've done too much wrong and you can never be forgiven and you can never confess your sin. God doesn't want to hear about it. God's ashamed of you. He can never use you. He doesn't want you. He's tired of you. He's turned his back on you. He's forgotten about you. He doesn't really love you. And all those lies he plants so that they can keep on smoldering and smoldering to tear down our faith. He wants to get us into fear. Do you know fear is the number one weapon? The very first weapon that he used after the fall of man. Do you know that? Adam and Eve sinned. God came walking in the garden and said, Adam, where are you? Well, God knew where Adam was. He wanted Adam to realize where he was. And Adam says, well, we heard your voice, God, but we hid because we were afraid. Right after the fall of man, the very first thing the enemy used was fear. To separate man from God. Wow. Wow. Another thing we learned about the shield of faith is that it had the name on it. The insignia was the same of everybody in the same company. In the same, you know, a centurion was over a hundred. So whoever was in that regiment, they all had the same painting on their shield. So at any moment, if you were lost in battle, all you have to do is look around. You see the, 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 the painting on the shield that's the same as yours. Those are your guys over there. If someone fell in battle, they would know which, which company he was from and they would know his name. But what we uh, talked about last week is exactly what Zachary was, was uh, exhorting us with today. Is that every promise in the book is yes and amen to whom? To him that believeth they're personalized promises and you can put your faith in the fact that the promise that your, your faith your faith the shield of faith right in the fact that the promises of God have got your name on them amen healing has by faith is yours amen victory by faith is yours provision by faith it's mine and so when the enemy says you can't have, you don't have, you're not going to get, get well, you're not going to be healed and all those things, then you advance with faith. You shove your faith in his face and say, wait a minute, the Bible says, and look here, it's got my name on it. <laughs> Read it and weep. And if you can't read it, let me quote it to you. By his stripes, I am healed. And then we take the sword of the spirit, the word of God. What we've got our faith in. Amen. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus do? When the enemy attacked him. <laughs> uh, it is written. He quoted the word, right? He quoted the word. Wow. Now look at your neighbor and say, now there, that was the review. So we talked about the fact, number one, that faith throws the enemy off balance. Okay? Number two, faith is more effective when it's used together. You saw that picture of, of the testudo, which in Latin means t uh, tortoise. Okay? It's a shell. They get in the shell. Okay, I read the battle uh, that Mark Antony's men were in and they came into the Testudo and the, when they saw them go down to their knees, uh, the enemy thought they had them. So they jumped off their horses and charged them. And all they did was jump up, extend their line, go right through them because they'd been protected by the shield. Amen. But faith is effective when it's used together. Well, how, how do you know that? Well, let's look in the word of God in Leviticus chapter 26 verses 7 through 9. Your enemies, you will, uh, your, your enemies will chase you. Is that what it says? No. You will chase your enemies. And they will fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred. And a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. For I will look favorably... And make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. What is the covenant? 
Well, the covenant is, is that we have promised uh, and committed our lives to him and all that we are and all that we have is committed to him. See what a covenant is, it's a 100%, 100% agreement. It's not a contract. Contract can be any per, uh, percentage you want to state. 50, 50, 70, 30, 60, 40, 80, 20, right? Somebody's responsible for their 50. Marriage is not 50, 50. You know why? Because it's not a contract. It's a covenant. It's 100% in, 100% in. Both people on both sides of the table throw all the chips to the middle and say, we're all in. A covenant in the Old Testament says, everything I have and everything uh, that, uh, uh, all the energy I have, the resources I have will be put on the table to honor and defend you as though you were my own. I'm making a covenant with you. And everything's all in. It's 100%. Uh, it's 100% in. So what do we do with God? We say, Lord, I'm yours. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1, that you present your bodies. That's you, all of you, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service or your spiritual act of worship. Okay? Give it all to God. And then what does God give back in return? Well, I'll, I'll put a little drip on him every now and then make him feel good. No. Every promise has got your name on it. Everything he said in the book is yours. God puts all the resources of he heaven to your defense. See, Abraham and Lot were in a covenant. So when Lot got attacked, what did Abraham do? He sent his men and servants out. And with it, I mean, these are, these are sheep herders. And they're going to battle against an army. Is that smart? Untrained sheep herders against a trained army? Anybody think that's smart? That ain't very smart, is it? No. But why did he do it? Because they had a covenant. And, he, and the covenant says, everything I have will be put to bear in support and defense of you. So he sent everybody out and then God gave them favor and they defeated the army that had attacked Lot. That's what a covenant is. So God says, I'm going to confirm my covenant with you. That when you lock arms side by side with fellow believers, when you join your faith together, you have greater protection against the enemy. That's why the word of God says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. Because you're out there, you're fighting the enemy on a daily basis, and sometimes you need to get your shield next to somebody else who's got some faith and connect those shields together and take a massive advance against the enemy to say, guess what, enemy? Not in my church, not in my family, not in my community, not in my home. Home, not in my life amen amen, amen. I, I look at our monday night prayer group uh we we communicate on group me and and I, you, you scroll back through there and you'll see several answers to prayer over the last few weeks my aunt clara uh, she's never been really sick she's in her 80s work circles around most teenagers and i'm talking about the the ones that are full of energy not all of them are full of energy, but yeah. And, and, and she's never been in the hospital since her daughter, Treva, who's 62 years old. Sorry, Treva. Um, was born until a couple weeks ago, and she, and she got sick. And then they, she's, her, she was having a lot of fluid swelling. They sent her in, did an x-ray. They said, we've got to have her come back for a CT scan with contrast. We, we, we see an aneurysm. We put it up on the Monday night prayer group. And you know what happened? Their church was praying. Our church was praying. What happened? We locked shields together. <laughs> and she came out Thursday and said, she, she, she didn't have any aneurysm. There's no sign of aneurysm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And you can flip back through that and you can see an answer and answer and answer and answer to prayer. Why? Because when we come together and we lock our shields together, Jesus knew the power of that. That's why Jesus said, Jesus said, assuredly, Matthew 18 verses 18 through 20, assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, I love that promise. Okay, what, what, uh, in one place, one writer said, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. 
And whatever you unlock is unlocked. And whatever you lock up is locked up. Hallelujah. And that's what he's saying. Whatever you bind or lock up on earth will be uh, from the earthly position will be bound in the heavenly realm. Whatever you loose from the earthly position will be released in the heavenly realm. You remember we're in a spiritual battle, not a physical battle, right? So we have the power through prayer and through faith to stand in the earthly dimension and affect things in the spiritual dimension. And here's what Jesus followed that with. Now that's a great promise. I'm giving you the keys, giving you the authority. And again, I say to you, what does that say? If two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask. Now, there are two powerful words, three powerful words there I want you to look at. First of all, two. Look at your neighbor and say, that means more than one. Then there's the word agree. And then there's the word anything whoa that's a big word do you know what the word anything covers anything some of y'all were ahead of me on that one yeah anything that they will add that they ask it will be done for them by my father in heaven he extends the line a little further and says for where two or three are gathered together in my name shield to shield there I am, I am there in the midst of them. I love that statement, I am there, not, oh, he said if we'd, if we'd come together, I've heard this all my life, he said if two or three would come together, he would come too. No, he's already there. No, he said, I am there. It's not that he's going to show up eventually, he's already there. He promised if two of you come together in his name, he's already present. Wow, now we know he's omnipresent, but we're talking about manifest presence. Brother John, hallelujah, amen. So Jesus was talking about the power of joining shield to shield, hooking our faith together. And when we agree upon something, that's why at the end of this service today, we're gonna give you the opportunity, if you're struggling with anything, if you need something uh, from God, to come and agree with someone in prayer. We do it every week. You hear me quote this scripture a lot. Why? Because we're standing on the promises of God. They've got our name on them. And if we will come and agree in prayer, what we will agree for and what we ask for in faith, God will do it for us. Why? Because he's going to prove his covenant to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Now look at James chapter 5 verses 14 through 18. Is anyone among you sick? Stay at home. Quarantine. And quote scripture. Well, sometimes it's wise to stay at home if you're contagious. And you should be quoting scripture to uh, use the sword of the spirit. But that's not what James said. James says, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. I love the word will. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. And then he says, confess your trespasses or your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And then he goes to this. Listen, watch this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. Now, the only place you'll find that term prayer of faith in Scripture is right here in James. And James is showing us two things about the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith works when the elders come together and join shields of faith together. They connect our faith together. And we pray and we do what the Scripture says. We anoint with oil. And then God responds not only does he heal, he forgives. Isn't that cool? You know why? Because Jesus paid for all of it in the atonement. 
Wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. The same faith that we access the atonement for healing, we are access the atonement for salvation. The same faith, the same atonement for healing and for salvation. So he takes care of it. And then he goes on to say, now, does it only work? What if you're in a situation you can't get anybody to agree with you? You can't get anybody there. You can't post on Facebook, I need prayer. Praying. You know, well, does it work when you're on your own? Well, Elijah was a man, single man, just one, with a nature like ours. With a nature like ours. What does that mean? Human nature. He was an ordinary Joe. He's just an ordinary guy. And he prayed. <laughs> He prayed in faith that it would not rain. Why did he pray that it would not rain? That's very cruel, isn't it? Because the people had turned their hearts to Baal. And Baal, they believed, was the one who sent the rain. And so he said, Lord, show them who really sends the rain. And after three and a half years of no rain... What did they do? They gathered on Mount Carmel and they sacrificed. He said, you guys, if you want to really know where the rain and the fruitfulness comes from, it doesn't come from Baal. But if you want to try it again, go ahead. And from morning until evening, they worshipped Baal, sacrificed to Baal, did all kinds of crazy things, cut themselves. I mean, all kinds of crazy mess. And no answer. Elijah prays a very simple prayer. I think it's 53 or 54 words. I've counted them before. Very short prayer. Fire falls from heaven. And then he says, Ahab, uh, dude, <laughs> you might want to get to some higher ground because the rain's fixing to come. And what happened? Rain. 53 or 54 words did that? Oh, yeah. Why? That's because Elijah was like some supernatural. No. He was an ordinary man like us. Now let's look at the scripture in Psalm 91. Psalm 91 verse 4 says this. He shall cover you. Again, what's covering? Covering is a sign of defense and protection. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth will be your shield and Buckler. Now, what's a buckler? Well, a buckler uh, in, in David's day differed from a shield in that a buckler had a handle on the back, was held in a fist grip, and could be extended at an arm's length. A shield in David's day was strapped to your forearm. Okay? So you could only shield by moving your forearm, and you could not shield out at arm's length because the shield would be behind your hand you had to have your hand free sometimes there might be a loop that you would have in your hand but it was mostly strapped to your forearm okay that was the shield in David's day okay but a buckler was a smaller version of a shield anywhere from 8 to about 18 inches round that you could extend in a fist grip out at arm's length to protect yourself from a greater distance. Not only that, because it had uh, this rounded shape on the front behind the handle, it, 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 it protected your hand. Okay? Even if you had a shield strapped to your forearm, your hand was still exposed. Okay? And often, in a sword conflict, if they cannot get to you, they'll go for your hand or your wrist. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was doing some research on this, I found that, the, 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 that one ancient form uh, of archery, uh, as a matter of fact, one of the oldest archery manuals ever found, dating all the way back to about the 1200s, shows, shows sword and buckler fighting. And often they would block sword blows and then follow with their own sword. Sometimes they would work parallel so that they protected their hands. Okay? So the buckler was this smaller version 
of the shield that could be extended at an arm's length. Now, what the Romans did is they took the best of both worlds, okay? And they took the large shield and added like a buckler to the front of it with the grip handle on the back, okay? Um, so long, when David wrote this, he didn't know that one day the Romans are going to say, hey, let's just put those two things together, best of both worlds, and now we've got something that will protect us at arm's length, and then they rounded it and did a, a whole, whole other bunch of advancements and, and uh, formations to protect their troops even greater, but, but the Bible says that his truth will be your shield and buckler. Now, according to sword and buckler fencing, quote, a buckler differs from a shield in that the latter is carried, the shield, uh, by straps and worn on the arm, whereas the former is held single hand in a fist grip. It is difficult to trace the history of the weapon as many types of round shield or small Targay uh, would be called buckler regardless, regardless of whether it was held in the fist or worn on the arm. The buckler was a small, maneuverable, handheld shield for defecting and punching blows. One of the things they would do is not only do this because of the size of it, they would also turn it up this way. Okay? In, 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 our, in World War I, they wore hats similar to this. And they were trained to use that helmet as a striking weapon because that sharp edge would cut a gash. I didn't know that until I was studying this. Um, bucklers were typically round between 8 to 16 or 18 inches of diameter. And a diameter. Now, here's the other thing I found. That while the shield was used by the military, these were carried by civilians for personal defense. This was the open carry weapon of the day. <laughs> That, that if you were going out on the street, especially at night, there weren't lights. It was dark. You know, there were bad people, even back in those days. And so if someone came to attack you, a lot of people would carry one of these as a defensive weapon. If someone came and tried to knock you over the head, take your stuff, they would also carry swords, but they would carry a buckler. This was carried by ordinary people. With natures just like ours. You getting where I'm going with that? Elijah was a man, the King James says, with like passions as we, or with an ordinary nature. He was just a civilian, guys. <laughs> he was just an ordinary person. But he used faith in what God has said. He used faith in the truth of God's word. His truth shall be my shield and buckler. His truth is what I can as an ordinary individual. I'm not Peter. I'm not Moses. I'm not Paul. I'm not Gideon. I'm just an ordinary Joe. <laughs> Hallelujah. However, the truth of God in your hand is just as powerful as the truth of God in anybody else's hand. When you put your faith and your confidence in what God has said and you can stand behind it and say, I, God said it, I believe it, and as far as I'm concerned, that settles it. And I'm going to take my stand on the truth of God's word, on Christ. The solid rock I stand in what he's done for me, in what he's promised me, in what he's paid for for me, in what he's promised to give me for eternity. I put my faith in Jesus. I take my stand on him and what his word says he has done. And because of that, as an ordinary individual, whew, hallelujah, I can affect things in the heavenly realm. Amen. You say, well, pastor... I don't know if I got on all that armor. I don't know if I know how to use all that. That's, you sound like David then. They put Saul's armor on David and he's like, man, I'm not used to this. <laughs> but you know what? I've been out there worshiping God on my harp. <laughs> and an old lion came up and tried to steal some of my sheep. So I grabbed what I was familiar with. I picked me up a rock in my sling and whew, whew, bam, hit that old boy in the head. And then I grabbed my hunting knife, went up there and dispatched with him. And then later on, a big old bear came. 
I was, I was just trying, I was minding my own business, praising God and watching the sheep grazing. We were praising and grazing. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And that's what some of y'all are going to do when the buffet opens back up too, aren't you? <laughs> we're going to be praising and grazing. Oh, hallelujah. I buffet my body. Bring it in. Oh, that's buffet, wasn't it? I'm sorry. <laughs> and he said, you know what? I grabbed what I knew. Did you catch that? I grabbed what I knew. Hit that old boy in the head, grabbed my hunting knife, I went and dispatched to him. You are not taking sheep out of this flock. Pastor, I don't know every promise. Grab the one you know. Pastor, I don't know every scripture. Grab the one you know. Put confidence in the one you already know. Hallelujah. Well, I, you know, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm outfitted like, 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 uh, like Sister Susan. She's a real prayer warrior, and she's been a prayer warrior for a long time, and she's called to intercession. She's a watchman on the wall, and you can say, I don't feel like I'm outfitted like she is. You know what? You may not be outfitted quite like she is, but you, there's a promise you know. Grab the promise you know. And you know what? <laughs> Elijah, an ordinary guy, believed that when he prayed, God was responsive. And so he prayed, and he prayed, and, and you know what he prayed? was not for his benefit. It was for the benefit of the people to know who God was. And when you pray what you know with the motivation that the glory goes to God, did you catch that? Pray what you know, motivated by the fact that God's going to be the one receiving the glory for it. An ordinary, individual, civilian walking around with a sword that doesn't look very big can drive the enemy back in faith when you put it in what Jesus has said and you take a stand on it. Amen. Somebody needs to give God praise. Hallelujah. I know I'm hitting you. I know I'm hitting you with a whole lot of information. And a whole lot of history. But as I've studied this, what, I, what I'm trying to get us to understand is what would those people understand that Paul was talking about that we don't know? So I had to dig in a little bit. And the more I dig in, the more I see. And the more I see that God has enabled each of us to take like David the thing we know, the thing we're assured of. Now that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that's all that David ever used. Amen. Now, he went out, when he went out against Goliath, he killed the giant with what he knew. But the next time David was under attack, when he had an army coming after him, he realized he needed more than just what he already knew. So you know what he did? He went to the house of God. He went to the house of God and he found the priest, Abijah. He said, Abijah, I got an army coming after me. I need a weapon. And he said, well, that sword that you took from Goliath and cut his head off with is hanging over here as a testimony. As a matter of fact, if you look in Chronicles, the Bible says that the, the guys who were captains over a hundred went to the temple and the priest gave them all the shields and swords that David had collected from his enemies. <laughs> they were hanging up in the house of God. Why? Testimonies. Oh, you remember when, they, when the old devil tried to kill me with that one right there? Yeah, hallelujah. God defended me. Look at that right there. Oh, you remember? Oh, he sent that big one against me right there. See, that? See how big that thing is? Man, that was a big, there was a big giant coming after me with that one right there. But God delivered me again. Look at that one over there. Oh, you remember that time I got sick and they told me I wasn't going to make it? That was a big one right there. But God delivered me again. You remember that time I lost my job and, and, and it looked like I wasn't going to be able to pay my bills and just in time some money came through and and then right after that, I got a job. See that testimony hanging right there, guys? Look back there when my marriage was in trouble and God restored us and put us back together. Look back there when my family was about to fall apart and my children had gone astray. And see that testimony hanging on the wall. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we gathered and they gathered up all those. 
and sent the army out. But David went to the house of God. What do you need to do to get more than just what you know? You need to come to the house of God to hear the word of God. You need to go to the word of God yourself. And you need to equip yourself with some more tools. And David didn't go out and fight the army with a sling. He realized there was more that he needed to know. Amen. What I'm telling you is, your shield of faith might feel more like a buckler right now. And you might just have to use what you know. What you know will work. If it's what God said, it'll work. God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. If you really want to get right down to it, if God said it, that settles it whether you believe it or not. But it won't work in your life unless you believe it. It'll work for everybody else because God said it and that settles it. But you have to believe it to experience it in your own life. And what God has taught you and what you already know. Faith in what he has promised. His truth is your shield and buckler. And no matter what size you think your shield is, it'll work. <laughs> and even when you can't get together with the elders and join all, lock all the shields together, you're just out there on your own. Guess what? Elijah was one man. Amen. And when Elijah got down and depressed, he said, Lord, I'm the only one. And the Lord said, no, you're not. No, you're not. There are thousands of knees that have not yet bowed to Baal. And they've been praying with you. You thought you were alone. You thought you were alone. Hallelujah. But there's some people with some bigger shields than yours. <laughs> Hallelujah. And they've been standing and they've been believing. And when you think you're out there on your own, and when you think this is all you got, you don't know that every Monday night covering is prayed over this entire body. And you don't know that on a weekly basis, our intercessors on a daily basis are praying covering over you, on your children, and your children, and, 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 and all those things we sang being prayed over you every day. You don't understand that. You just think you got this little thing and you're facing the enemy on your own. No, but there's a whole bunch of knees that have not bowed yet. Hallelujah. There's a whole bunch of prayers that have already gone up for you. And when you... Uh, then step forward in faith. You may not know about those other prayers, but God takes the power of all that other faith of the elders of the church and puts it behind the faith that you've got and you knock the enemy down and you keep on moving forward for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. But God doesn't want you to keep hiding behind your little shield. He wants you to grow in the fear and the admonition and the knowledge of the Lord so that you can be one of the ones carrying the big shield so that somebody who's just got a brand new baby faith in Jesus, just got saved, just got born again, you can say, get behind me. Hallelujah. Get behind me. Get behind me, soldier. You're just learning. But guess what? God's given me a big shield. I know a lot of promises. I'll teach some of them to you. If you'll just get behind me. If you'll just walk beside me. And all of a sudden, what you'll see is that your shield is growing. And before long, your little buckler is going to be right in the middle of a big old shield of faith. Hallelujah. Amen. And when the enemy starts shooting those lies at you, because that's all he's got. The Bible says that he is the father of lies. I've got that scripture in there, but I'm not going to go to it today. Stand with me. What does it mean if you're the father of lies? What does it mean if you're the father of lies? It means a lie is all you can produce. Amen. 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 A lie is all you can produce. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, some of you who know genetics better than me, help me out here if I'm wrong. But if I'm not wrong, women make one kind of chromosome. Men make two. Right? And the sex of the baby is determined by which chromosome the man of the man hooks up with the chromosome of the female. The girl's just going to make girls. That's all she's going to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because that woman, been married for a few years. Brother Harold, she's tired of dealing with men. Her whole body says, uh, I've had enough of that. <laughs> but see, the man 
can put forth a female or male chromosome. Opposites, right? Jesus told them, you are of your father, the devil. And he's only got one chromosome. Lies. That's my fault. And I'll tell you why that's my fault. Because I laid my buckler up there and all kind of lights are flashing. I was afraid that was going to happen. I don't know how many buttons I pushed, Brother Randall, but I pushed it. They're all flashing. Hallelujah. We got it back now. Thank you. Hallelujah. I'm sorry. I should have warned you. How every light on that thing was flashing. You see, the devil doesn't have a truth chromosome. He only has a lie chromosome. <laughs> see, God speaks to us in stuff that's so familiar and it just goes whew, right over our head sometimes we read it. He doesn't have a truth chromosome. Anything he tells you is a lie. So when he tells you you're not good enough, guess what? Lie. Everybody say lie. When he tells you you're not going to make it, guess what? When he tells you God doesn't love you, guess what? When he tells you God can never forgive your past. When he tells you God doesn't really want you. That's a bigger lie. When he tells you you're not going to, you're not going to make it through this, this one's going to take you out. Anybody ever heard a lie before from the devil? Anybody ever found a truth <laughs> to shove in his face? Amen. I right, look at this young man standing on the second pew right here, Hunter. Yeah. When he went to the doctor, they said, son, you're in a precarious place. If we operate, you can die on the table. You may be paralyzed from your neck down. You may never be able to walk. Your surgery is going to take, what did they say, 12 to 16 hours? Five hours they were done. All this loss of blood, and they had all this big blood supply there. He didn't lose hardly any. They said you could bleed out on the table, all these things they told him. You could never walk again. He climbs telephone poles for a living. Good night. Hunter, all that stuff the devil said about you, what was it? Lie. Lies. The only thing he can produce, Carl, lies. <laughs> Amen. He can't make a truth. Only a lie. But his truth, his truth, his truth is my shield. His truth is my buckler. And when the enemy fires his lies at me, sometimes we lower our shield and they get stuck right here. Sometimes they're stuck right here because of words from the past that before we even knew about a shield or a buckler of faith, words, curses were planted in our spirit. You're dumb. You're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not tall enough. Skinny enough. Big enough. Smart enough. Your parents didn't have anything. You're never going to have anything. Your whole family all messed up, jacked up. You don't even need to try to have a family because yours will be jacked up just like it. And he plants all that stuff in our heart and in our spirit. But you know what the Word of God says? That he renews our mind. His truth defends us against the attack of the enemy today. But the Bible says that the glory of the Lord goes before you. The presence of the Lord goes before you and His glory is your rear guard. 
Hallelujah. So that means when His truth is my shield and, I, and my buckler, it not only protects me from what's coming against me today, but it protects me from what's behind me. Those lies of the enemy that keep invading my mind and telling me that I'll never make it and I'm not good enough for God and He could never really use me. You see, His presence is before me, but the glory of God and His truth is both my shield and my buckler to protect me from what's in front of me and shield me from what's behind me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there are some of you today, you, you've been exercising your faith for what's coming right now. But the enemy keeps bringing what's behind you up. Hallelujah. Today, we're going to give you an opportunity to agree in that prayer of agreement.